Are you looking for more books to read? We've got you covered. Book Interrupted is now doing mini episodes called Author Spotlight, where we showcase authors and let them tell us about their books and why we should read them. You can find them on our Book Interrupted channel wherever you get your podcasts. Parental guidance is recommended because this episode has mature topics and strong language. Here are some moments you can look forward to during this episode of Book Interrupted. Now that you're mentioning it, I did check how long I've been watching it to be like, why hasn't Tom White shown up yet? Like, it kind of seemed like it was a mystery to Molly for a while. Like she, and maybe partially because she was being poisoned. I'm going to take it and do it for them what I think is best. It's like, how would your white ass know? Yeah. What's best (laughs) for someone who's not white? Because Molly's like the stoic Indian. And then Henry Rowan is the drunken Indian. These are the stereotypes that are are always shown on film. I had a nap. While watching the movie? (laughs) No, we had to stop the movie. I was like, I'm falling asleep. I was like, I need a 10 minute nap. So we turned off the movie. (laughs) I had a 10 minute nap and then we continued to watch the movie. (laughs) Yeah. Disrupted. Mind, body, and soul. Inspiration is the uh, And we're gonna talk it uh, out. On Book Interrupted. Welcome to Book Interrupted, a book club for busy people to connect and one that celebrates life's interruptions. During this book cycle, we're reading Kim's book pick, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders, and The Birth of the FBI by David Grant. This book was made into a movie in 2023 and stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, and Lily Gladstone. In the 1920s, the richest people per capita in the world were the members of the Osage Nation in Oklahoma after oil was discovered beneath their land. Then, one by one, the Osage began to be killed off. As the death toll rose, the newly created FBI took up the case, and the young director, J. Edgar Hoover, turned to Tom White to try to unravel the mystery. White put together an undercover team and together with the Osage began to expose one of the most chilling conspiracies in American history. Let's listen in to this episode's group discussion. I love it. I'm wearing a cowboy shirt. I was like, well, this makes me look like the bad guy, but oh well. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Hell yeah. Oh, you have an actual copy. Love it. Okay. It's from the library. The thing with reading books that have been made into movies recently is all their copies were on hold. You know, there's a long hold line, but the large print version only had a really short hold line. So I managed to get it and read it before. Well, we're at that age. Ladies today. Yeah, it's nice. Did you say it has large print? <laughs> yeah. They oh. always have like one large print it. of the new books. People, when they put them on hold, they don't look at the large print ones. Maybe they're leaving it for other people that need it. But it is nice reading a book of large prints. <laughs> like sometimes at the end of the day, I don't want to wear my glasses, right? I just want to like relax. Or if I'm reading in bed, I don't want to wear my glasses. So the large print turns out it's actually very nice. And then also I get through it faster. So I feel more accomplished because it's like, like, look at the, like how big the print is. It's nice. How did everyone else read? Kim should introduce it first. Introduce and then I'll ask. Okay. Welcome to our episode about killers of the flower moon, the Osage murders and birth of the FBI by David Grant. Are they the Osage? I called them Osage the whole time I read it and then I watched the movie last night and I'm pretty sure it's Osage. In the movie, they said Osage and in my yeah. head when I read the book, I said Osage. So I'm thinking yes. it's probably Osage because Me too. they made the whole movie and say it wrong. I hope not. I don't, yeah, I hope not too. So apologies for my original pronunciation. <laughs> it wasn't correct. Osage. So we got to sound yeah, I'll think about it. being an American. Osage, right? Osage. Like that makes me think I'm American. <laughs> so what'd you guys think? What a book. What a movie. What a friggin' story. Who read the actual book and who read audiobook? I was actual. I started with a digital and then I ended up with the actual. And I was looking for it in like a used bookstore. And I went to this used bookstore when I was visiting Ontario. And the guy's like, oh, we just sold a copy. He's like, but it wasn't very good. And then, so then I had this idea in my head. I'm like, well, the guy, owner of the bookstore must know if it's a 
poorly written book and then I had it in my head that I didn't want to read the book <laughs> all of a sudden it's like you don't even know you're just trusting this guy you don't even know just because he owns a bookstore I'm like well, he's around books a lot anyway but you know what one person considers good is different than another person anyway so even if you're friends your friends might think something's awesome and you're like that was terrible or vice versa usually the vice versa for me like <laughs> people don't always like the books they like women who run with the wolves me and Kara are like amazing and you guys are right. like mm, not so I went in with a bit of a bias right. this was written poorly but uh, then I got it so I had very low expectations going in but I thought it was fine I, well on I that note pretty- how did you like the way it was written because I found the way that it was written for me I didn't have a problem with it but it was very factual like it was like mm-hmm. a re- report rather it was like than a, report. a story yeah. yeah it felt like it was a reporter telling a story yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. which I liked because I think that's what it is right yeah. like I didn't know what it was going to be but it gave a reporter vibe to it for sure I don't read true crime ever like never mm-hmm. it's not a genre I ever read because I don't I feel like it's so horrible I don't want to read something that really happened so I don't know how normal true crime books are written I have no idea but I liked how it was written kind of just reporting and the way he wrote it like reporting because I would have been lost in all the details if he hadn't mm-hmm. written it the way he wrote it because I would have been like who's that guy again and who because there's so many people in mm-hmm. the book that he pieced together but the way he did it because it was very reporting each section I didn't feel lost by the end when he's talking about different I don't don't want to say characters, different actual people, because the way he set up the book was very factual and I don't know how to categorize each chapter. Yeah, Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't feel lost if I stopped reading the book and went back to it. It was way easier for me to, I just assumed all true crime is written in that way, but I guess not. Mm -hmm. I thought it was easy for me to follow because of the way he wrote that. I agree. And I read the actual book. Yeah, so I read the audio book. Uh, and I listened to a lot of true crime, and I felt like the way that the audiobook was made it easy to follow along, especially like I can get so lost listening to an audiobook with like names, dates, not like just so much information in one time. But no, this one I felt like was easy for me to follow along with, and I didn't hate the audiobook, and I feel like I'm an audiobook hater just of the voices even though that's like almost how I solely read so just with that the audiobook for me was easy to follow along so I imagine reading the actual book would be just like that if not easier so yeah I read the book well I didn't finish the book sorry guys I didn't I read a lot of investigative journalism books and I didn't like this one at all the story itself is important but I didn't like the factual way like I think investigative journalism needs some kind of storytelling with it and I found Mm -hmm. it was just like fact after fact after person where it's like the description of things that were not needed the way that a guy who's doing the auction was dressed and there's like a whole page of exactly what he's wearing yeah yeah. I was like I don't care who cares what does it matter what this guy who you're never going to hear about again and like he keeps adding all these real life people whereas I felt it could have been a more streamlined story so I got about maybe halfway through and then I skimmed the rest and kind of saw there's three different parts I think and then the second part is him doing the investigative journalism and the last part's real stories of the people I think from before the last part is about other things that didn't get covered it's about other murders too because they're like oh the reign of terror kind of got blamed on this hail hail in earnest but they weren't the only people killing people out there and so that was just one piece but the rest of it wasn't pursued by the government to put charges against other people even if there was proof that's kind of one of the other things about this book is that it's showing J. Edgar Hoover was kind of using it to further his vision of the FBI being put together and being created and what he wanted and using it for his own political needs. But they knew that there was other murders that could have been prosecuted and could have been investigated. And they didn't do that because he was also using the Osage for his own needs in a different way. And so they weren't the only people killing people for their money out there. 
you know, there's a lot of other people dying. And so that the last part is he's talking to relatives of other family members that had been murdered mm. or disappeared or whatever. And what those families had tried to find out, because some of them had done their own investigations and had proof or evidence anyway of what happened, but no justice for them. So that was what the last part was. Anyway, sorry, I went off, but. No, no, thank you. Yeah, I think I yeah. should just reread that part because it's <laughs> the beginning just lost me with far too much detail and not enough story of what these people really went through i don't know like, it was obvious from the outset kind of who the bad guys were i kind of wish it was more unraveled a mm. little bit too yeah. right but i mean there's a certain amount if you write a book to bring a story to light if it's also an enjoyable book that you're more emotionally invested in that's going to maybe sell more copies which is one of the reasons it's good that they made a movie out of it because then that story gets out there to more people so that's nice or at least people know that it's a thing or it did seem kind of like obvious where everything was going i kind of would wish that it unraveled more i was also investigating it too you know like i didn't try to piece it together do you feel like it, you wish it was more of a mystery yeah a little In bit a, yeah, like yeah it kind of seemed like it was a mystery to Molly for a while. Like she, and maybe partially because she was being poisoned. You know, it's hard to piece things together if you're being poisoned and stuff. Well, also but... hard to just believe that. Or and believe that somebody yeah, could. To believe that that's your reality. Yeah, treat you one way, but also then to see that they look at you as money rather than a person that has feelings. <laughs> I digress. Also, it's hard because you get a sense that Ernest loved her. So when he's home with his family, he's just home with his family. And then he just, it's like he cut that off to be this horrible person with his uncle. Mm -hmm. I felt so sad for her at the end when she just wouldn't believe that Ernest was involved. Like she's like, no, not him. I, nope, I don't believe that. Until she did. That's my lovely husband. Yeah. And then it was, it was like, ha. Huh. It was so awful. At least he testified. I felt like it gave him a little bit of a, maybe he did love her and he Redemption. just was. I mean, that's what we want to believe. I just hope that there, yeah, was something for well, her. Though, you know what I mean? Like that it was redeemable in some way. The other thing is the last section. One of the things that Molly's granddaughter reveals is that her dad, Cowboy, told her that the night that the Smith house got blown up, Molly and the two children were supposed to be staying there that night. Mm. And the only reason they weren't in the house, too, is because Cowboy had an earache and she kept the kids home. Her and the children were also supposed to be murdered that same night in the explosion. I thought that they also said that Ernest, too, that what's his name, oh. Hale, wanted Ernest to be there as well. Oh, I didn't think it said that. I could try to look it up. Yeah, because I thought that then the comment afterwards was like, Ernest realized his uncle was trying to knock him off too. No, I think what she says was that, so her dad had to live with the knowledge that his father had tried to kill him. Kill him too. Yes. That wanted him dead. I don't think Ernest was supposed to be there. So that's Cowboy. I may misunderstood it thinking. Yeah, Cowboy's the yeah. son. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's Ernest and Molly's mm. son. And I feel like they changed that in the film where he was concerned, like, where were you? And she's like, we were at Rita and Bill's house. And he's Which like, you weird. have to stay home. I don't like that they changed that. I don't either. But you know what I read? She was talking about the, you wish it was more of a, like a mystery to solve or something. Yeah. Apparently, Lino DiCaprio was being interviewed in Martin Scorsese. And I'm not sure who told this, but originally the screenplay they were writing was just the screenplay of the book. They scrapped that screenplay and started again and realized the story was Ernest and Molly to make that the focal point rather than all of the different pieces that were in that book. So maybe that's why they were trying to make it more like what you're saying that you wanted. It didn't seem like Molly was the focal point in the movie. I don't think that they really got there. It felt like it was a movie about Ernest, the whole thing. If we're talking about Hollywood and what Sarah's saying, like the movie is watching Ernest betray Molly in real time. That's mm -hmm. where yeah. the hook is to, you know what I mean? For like the story of what you want to watch. I don't think that I mean, they should have probably reworked the screenplay still because I feel like they really sold the Tom White figuring it all out stuff, all of the implants. Like they barely, this yeah. is similar to like the Hunger Games. You don't even know when they introduce Ren 
all of a sudden there's a new character they're like hey this guy's his name's ren he's like well yeah i might have some family here or whatever but you know if you read the book oh he's an implant like they implanted him insurance guys like oh i just sold him or whatever and he's like oh i guess you have work tomorrow right it's like josh didn't know because i like we were watching it together do you know who those guys are and he's like no not really and i'm like those are all undercover fbi agents couldn't they have a scene where he's hiring these people or he's sending them a letter yes yeah but that's what i mean like they spent three hours on Ernest and Molly and like yeah. fucking hail, hail like slow talking to so it was way too long and slow to do the story and then to wrap it all up they had to cram it all in and I just think that it wasn't really ready <laughs> it wasn't well and like who wants to watch a movie all about just bad guys yeah right like I'm not rooting for the bad guys it's like you, you didn't feel like you cared about those guys at all which made it hard totally. I needed something to care about in the movie yes For such a long movie, too, to hold your attention, I think it's really, it felt like it just dragged on Yeah, for me. I think if I didn't read the book, I don't think I would have known what was going on in the movie because I was just so, like, occupied with other things. I just, it just didn't hold my attention. So I'm kind of glad some of you guys are saying the same because I was like, oh, I don't know if this is supposed to be. It was just so long and slow. Like, I would have preferred if they made a movie from, like, almost Molly's point of view where she's falling in love with this husband and maybe every once in a while there's something weird that kind of twerks her but like otherwise she's happy and has a husband if it's going to be three hours long so hour long they fall in love and molly thinks it's for real and legit hour two we see the exact same movie again but from Ernest's perspective and it includes all of the underhanded bullshit he's doing with his uncle yeah and then hour three can be tom white figuring it out or whatever uncovering it somehow if we have to have a three and a half hour movie that makes because then it would be like a mystery then it would have that gone girl effect you know what i mean Uh where you're like you would be able to feel what molly probably felt because you would start as molly thinking you're just having a husband and being like well maybe he wants me for my money this shit's going on here like and then really having it like revealed to the viewer anyway how bad and how underhanded he was. He also wasn't, I don't think, giving her the shots of poison insulin. No, that was, was his movie. Exactly. Because in the yeah, book, it was like, movie. once she stopped having that from those doctors, then she started to get better. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I like, thought they... she got better when Tom White sent her to a hospital. She started getting better. Yes. When she... Exactly. When she stopped receiving her insulin from those doctors. Yeah. The part from where the like doctors. the husband's giving her the meds, like that didn't really happen. I don't think. I think they just added it in to add how bad he was just to seal the deal in case there was anyone was left wondering if they could stay together or something. Like... <laughs> Why doesn't she just forgive him for killing her entire family? No, yeah, that wasn't in it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Does the movie really need to be three and a half hours long? I no, guess is like, the, no, there was, I it was slow. Yes, too slow. It was just boring in too many parts. Yeah. yeah. I think they also should have introduced Tom White earlier. He should have been like investigating. Knowing him, doing the investigation. They shouldn't have started with, I think, Ernest arriving. I should have, they should have started with Tom White being told he needs to do this investigation a little bit about why he was chosen and something like that. I don't know. Yeah, it was three hours. I liked the movie. Now that you're mentioning it, I did check how long I've been watching it to be like, why has Tom White shown up yet? Like, how? Like, like, why do we pause it at one point? We're like, there's still an hour and a half left? What? I didn't check twice. I was like, mm. first it was like an hour. And I was like, when is White going to get there? When are they going to even start investigating? What the hell? And then I checked again when there was like a, and he still didn't show up, but he showed up soon after. But I think it was two hours in and he wasn't even in no, the true. film. And I was it's like, true. what the hell is happening? Yeah. And I it's kind like, of yeah. weird because the book is like all Tom White kind of revealing how he understood yeah. it or uncovered it so then for him not to show up till the very end with that stuff was weird they changed things to make them a little bit more dramatic I could have got this wrong I maybe mean, i'm remembering the book differently what was her name anna the sister that got murdered was it anna or Anne, mm-hmm. anna 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 brown whatever? Anna Brown yeah, Anna, Anna. in the movie she tries to shoot somebody with a gun and then she gets murdered and it's like I don't think that happened it kind of made her look like she she wasn't good it kind of demonized her a little bit as this person who was I think she she did show up at the party and she was drunk in the book 
And she made a uh, scene. She was a, a flapper. Scene. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, she has a flapper. Like she'd been party, like gone to a. The scene she, was her drunkenness, is what. Yeah, you're but led like to believe in, in the, the movie, book. she's like really making a bigger scene and tries to sh- pull out her gun and stuff. And so I feel like parts of the movie try to demonize a little bit the victims, make them more know. interesting, make it look like really? well maybe they got killed by accident, maybe to make it more believable. But it's like the story is innocent people are being murdered, not that somebody got you know killed and kind of deserved it i think the idea is that like well then maybe people weren't being suspicious because oh anna was bad news anyway or people aren't suspicious because this guy has melancholy anyway that was not the story people weren't suspicious because of racism people right? were suspicious but people were suspicious to and they didn't they're like yeah that's suspicious but who cares as the yes. story right yeah. was that mm-hmm. this whole group of people were being used because they had oil right i didn't like that the movie tried to make it like you know maybe it wasn't as suspicious as it seems but it's like no the story is it was all very suspicious yeah right off the bat they were suspicious everybody was like pretty it was just like people were just seemed to be fine with it not everybody obviously but some people were just fine with it. the people who are supposed to be enforcing the law let's say we're okay with just turning the other way it seems like a really concentrated example of the history of colonialism <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, it's a very specific example of how this plays out, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm also interested to know if, one, the author was involved in the adaptation, and two, if it was a male who wrote the adaptation. It is. It was Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay, because I was... And other people. So I was going to say maybe they're not even intentionally or maybe they are intentionally making the victim seem a little more deserving because I think just from my personal experience so many men they don't take the accountability or the blame and there's so much justification so I'm almost wondering if that was like on purpose or maybe even by accident or something an unconscious bias kind of thing yeah yeah that could be why a lot of our opinions are kind of they're bad people we're not rooting for them Right. but oh they're gonna die anyway but to guys they're like well that's that's who we are what are you talking about or something you know i don't know if that makes any sense or if i'm just talking shit but no it makes sense yeah <laughs> right you're wondering was it intentional or unintentional no. yeah yeah but like what it came off as was like uh you're kind of making it look like this person was going to die anyway so oh well mm-hmm. right is it Nobody. whitewashing yeah a little bit hale said that in the movie even though it was almost like it was a plot piece to be like well, Anna's always been, she's got a mouth on her. That's why, like, the very thing that you're not liking there was what he was kind of saying in the movie, too. But in real life, he wasn't killing her because, like, oh, she was going to meet her end anyway. That's what he wanted other people to believe. He was just like, this is business. Killing her for money. He wanted other people to believe yeah. that, though. Yeah. So... There was at the end of the movie, there's, like, the credits are all the, like, people that were involved with their pictures. I don't know, in the one I was watching. And it was director white man producer older white man they all looked almost identical producer white man producer white man writer white man and then the writer of the book white man <laughs> i was like uh, it seems like a bias or a skewed and i also think there's this, this whole thing in hollywood of oh wow the indigenous characters are being played by real indigenous people and it's like if this is the bar that it's we are low. setting this is a real low bar that whoa yes, it's so obviously. good that shouldn't it be obvious that that should happen oh yeah it's totally it's pretty <laughs> like minimal right. you want a pat on the back congratulations uh, right oh, but there's that's there's another thing that goes to the other extreme there was like an uproar that someone i can't remember was playing someone who had cerebral palsy oh maybe it's i can't remember the actor's name but he played stephen hawking and so he plays stephen hawking before he's incapacitated and then he plays him after and they're all like you should have got a real guy with cerebral palsy to play that role like we're like oh yeah obviously sometimes Fair. it's you know what i mean like it's i don't well, even it doesn't know how to sell say it, in hollywood like... right unless it's sexy whiteness it doesn't sell yeah so for us it's so oh that's so obvious to do that because like duh you want to see representation you want an actual account actual struggles 
But I feel like in Hollywood, it's it doesn't matter if hiring a white person is going to bring you in an extra five mil, then do it. Well, also too, though, like representation, if all of the white people are in charge of all of the things that we do, then they would hire all of the white people because that's what represents them. Like, yeah. again, it would be like potentially the blind spot of like, oh, yeah, obviously this actor can play that role. We'll just it's darken little... his skin or whatever. Like, yeah. it's a little ironic, though, for the story they're telling. Right? Totally. Totally. Bit. But I do think it's good that this story is being told, too, because I didn't, this is the first time that I've known about it. I didn't know it. And I also thought it was interesting. Do you think it's interesting? Because I don't remember them mentioning Tulsa in the book, but they mentioned Tulsa in the movie a couple times. So I don't know if they did that to, like give it a shout out because it was like happening at the same time and they didn't want to discriminate against someone else's major trauma history. Like, I don't know why they did that because I didn't realize too. It wasn't in the book. Yeah. Right. So then they started talking about Tulsa and this is all Oklahoma, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe that's why, like, I don't know. Like it was weird to me that Tulsa was all of a sudden thrown in there. Maybe it was just showing like race relations in the States at the time Maybe that are contact that are you know already strained like this is happening everywhere yeah and nothing yeah nothing's being done or maybe in the book i was very interested that at the time this was all happening they're only beginning to have structure of police forces and stuff in the u.s before it was like the, the, your community just does it you just get together and think okay you do you investigated the, this one this time i felt that was interesting because i think that has relevance especially for the tom white character It was kind of lawless. And then he came in for the government. I work for the government. My job is to make justice, right? There should have been something about that too. Anyway, I liked the movie for the book. I think it did a decent Mm. job of three and a half hours trying to put everything that was in that book because it was so much stuff in that book. It was long and dense and small print. I thought I did a good job. But now that you guys are mentioning different things, I was like, oh, yeah, I thought that too. And oh, yeah, when I was watching the movie, I thought that too. It's just at the time, I was like, no, I think they did an okay job. I think it would be a really hard book to make into a movie because of it's and it was over a span of like 10 years or something. Is that right? 10 years? Maybe even maybe 20? longer. The Bill like earlier and- ones, I think, spanned that time. But then there was other deaths that they know from before that people got head rights from and after Mm -hmm. and after yeah yeah do you think the movie is so popular because it's all those famous actors that are in it and if it wasn't do you think that the population of the states or i guess world or whatever would pay as much attention to the story i think having martin scorsese doing it is a big one he got some big names they could have had the big names And it could have been not only about Hale and Ernest, you know? It was just like, you're watching this movie with the bad guys. And then anybody who's not bad is just kind of like a bit character. (laughs) It just felt, I don't know. Waiting to be killed off. And like, they're the main characters, really. Mm -hmm. Although it is called the Killers of the Flower Moon. The story is about the killers. It's not about everybody else. (laughs) Well, that happens so often in, especially listening to true crime it's always about the killers. It's the never killers. about the victims. The victims get like yeah. such a small mention, basically, right? In that way, I felt like it's very relatable to so much stuff that I digest. And I don't even think we realize that we put so much focus on the killers versus the victims. Oh, yeah, this victim was, you know, she was a female, early 20s, blonde hair, green eyes, etc., and then it's like, so anyways, back when the killer was born. Yeah, totally. Let's get back to the killer. He's <laughs> anyway. so interesting. You know, like yeah. their whole life. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And it's everything that leads oh. up to their life in there. But then when it comes to the victims, it's like, yeah, their birthday is April 25th, 1990, died 20 years later. You know, yeah. it's, <laughs> the detail is so small for the victims versus the killers that's a total valid point i feel like it's because of decolonization and reconciliation and everything the fact that this one is a true crime about the killing of indigenous people that we were like oh you know what i mean like trying Mm -hmm. to be good it's still it's still the white man telling the story yeah yeah you know like it's it's the same story with different 
characters, basically, that we've heard so many times. It's not the Indigenous people telling they're being victimized, right? Like, you make a really great point, because it's never the victim telling the story, Mm -hmm. right? Like, it never really is. But in this case, we were like, they should be the focus and whatever, because we've got raised awareness around decolonization and reconciliation. But on a grander scale, that's never the case, right? It's a the killers get sensationalized. I would have liked to see a story that was like a movie more focused on Molly and her sisters, their relationship. And because that's why it was so devastating. Like her whole family got taken out, all of her sisters. It's devastating that because like indiscriminately any Osage that even the fact that half of them were declared incompetent. So white people had to be in charge of their <sighs> money. And like the, there's a whole I bunch of stuff in the story that is way more important to be talking about or focusing on it's killing the indians in so many different ways right exactly it's complete control over someone it's slaves were uh became illegal after i don't remember when but people were still enslaved you know like whether or not it was legal or not there was different ways to make people it just got more subtle more underground. Yeah, oh, totally right. Yeah. And it's like, no, 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 we're doing this for them. They don't know what they're doing. Mm. So I'm going to take it and do it for them what I think is best. It's like, how would your white ass know? Yeah. You know what's best <laughs> for mm-hmm. someone who's not white? Yeah, I can't believe that they had a. Yeah, the money thing. Do you know that the actress Lily Gladstone, who played Molly, won uh, the Golden Globe for Best Actress? Do you all know that? Oh, wow. That's pretty good. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. just recently. Best Actress in a Drama Motion Picture. I just wanted to make sure I knew her name. I was looking it up, but Lily Gladstone. So that's pretty cool. I don't know who she was up against. I think it was a tough role to play too, because they addressed this in the movie by saying that like, don't talk too much because Hale's coaching Ernest being like, you know, if you talk too much, you'll you'll be, I don't know, criticized about that. Molly was this kind of calm person who's you got that impression in the book and that she might not be saying so much out loud as, you know, Ernest was, blabbering on or whatever and so i think it it was maybe a tough role to play where they don't have any inner monologue going on in the movie and she's supposed to both show this you know kind of calm demeanor she's the one who takes care of the family right like she's the one who takes care of the mom and she's kind of like got that role in the family where she's responsible one taking care of everybody and she's got things together right she's got her shit together but then you're trying to be like an actress showing that calm demeanor but also experienced all this stuff it was that was i think a tough role look like you have it together all the time but also that you're being affected by all the stuff that's going around you i don't know yeah you're all your family's being murdered your husband's family's racist and horrible and you are slowly being poisoned and you're still supposed to be like you have no control over your money you have to go and ask somebody for no control of your money just no control over your life at all it's like scary and devastating there's this other author named thomas king what did he write the inconvenient indian is one of his books and in that book he's talking about how i don't know if it's hollywood or the white like i don't know how he characterizes whoever it is that is doing this right there's a thing where it's not I think appropriate or it's at least one dimensional that he calls out about how stereotypes about indigenous people are reinforced and I feel like as we're talking about this I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking like oh my gosh like is that what's happening here too because Molly's like the stoic Indian and then Henry Rowan is the drunken Indian these are the stereotypes that are are always shown on film of when you have an indigenous representation on a film it's these the characters fall into these categories or the warrior india as we discuss like oh a white man produced it and a white man wrote this book and then we're just talking about how the people that it's depicting show up in the movie i'm seeing those things and i'm like is that what's happening even right here right now it's so crazy and like oniony layers because you think on the surface, oh, this is, you know, we're finally acknowledging what happened and revealing it. Or even when Tom White went to go and search it out and and solve the crimes, it was some version of altruistic, but really it wasn't because Hoover was trying to further his popularity and create a thing and whatever, and like using it. And even just right now, like Hollywood's finally acknowledging indigenous people and she won the Golden Globe and look at how good we're being, but they're still 
those shades of that stuff that indigenous people are saying like this is not okay or whatever Mm -hmm. it's so complicated like it's just so insidious and yeah yes. people might not even realize that how they perpetuate still, yes the film producers may have not even realized or the person writing the author may not have realized that's how they're still filling falling in into the, the categories yes they're still filling in those stereotypes and to them they might be like oh look like i'm representing indigenous people and their story yeah and it's I'm like, trying yeah to. from a white man perspective yeah <laughs> and uh, like you know just very stereotypical indigenous people it's is that a true retelling or is that a very biased retelling of the story yeah because and then you can't really hearken back to the book because the book is just like the facts of the incidences yeah. right so <laughs> we don't really know mm-hmm. if molly actually loved to fucking joke and tickle and we don't <laughs> we don't know because yeah. he didn't spend time talking about her character or her personality, right? The sister too, like she's the wild Indian, the savage, you know what I mean? Like even her mother says like, well, you're so wild. So yeah, in the movie, right? She does that. Or just even how a wild indigenous person is called savage, you know, mm-hmm. like it's that in a, of itself is so derogatory, right? Yeah. It's, they could just be living traditionally and that can be considered like so savage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really good points, Kim. I guess that's the end. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so fuck the book. Hey. I... <laughs> Can we talk about, I don't know the significance of the blanket. You know how Molly kind of followed more traditional stuff, whereas her sisters were like, was more in the flapper. And it was, I don't remember what, what the other two sisters were into but like into that stuff but molly had her blanket like that's so cool but i also did not like that they referred to the women as their blanket it's like that's just so gross when i read that i was like oh right it's just so disrespectful oh totally just even in the sense of being like the blanket as oh well she's gonna take care of me you know like she's gonna tuck me in she's gonna i get to rest while I have this blanket over me basically right and so of course the woman's got to go in go and do everything right yeah either blanket totally in a way it it shows so much knowledge too yeah it it shows like a very very deep understanding of the culture and the knowledge as well yeah I mean the design in general of the movie was I think well done the costumes and the outfits and the the way that the sets were and all that kind of stuff I thought was quite well done Uh, yeah like there was definitely some thought put into a lot of the details So I love that. I love that in books and movies when they take the time to add those details. You know, Easter eggs. I don't Mm. even know if that's really an Easter egg, but just kind of that extra thought. They could have literally just fucking jeans and a t-shirt. You know, like really (laughs) movies could do that if they wanted to. But to put the actual effort in to make it feel like a timepiece and make it feel like true to all the characters, I think is nice. I didn't realize everybody drives their cars on the... What do we normally do? The right hand side is the driver, which I found really interesting because I guess they would have been imported from England. So Mm. when did people start in North America having this the driver's Mm. seat on the left hand side? I didn't notice that at all. I don't know. That was like one detail. I thought I saw Leonardo DiCaprio on the left. Oh, no, he was on the right. He was on the right. Because he opened that door. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, So the driver was on the right hand side, Mm. which is very British. So... Was that all cars at that time or was it, and why did we end up going to the left? Like, where did that mm-hmm. happen? Like, was that a rebellion against the British government or for just practicality? And It wasn't until Ford released the Model T in 1908 that operating a vehicle while positioned on the left side began to become common practice. The revolutionary car was one of the first automobiles to have a left side steering wheel. I don't know. This is a so picture why? from the book, but I... Looks like he's in the middle. <laughs> so I don't know. We're going to try to find a different one. Why do we start with Quebec, waiting? Ontario, and the central provinces have always driven on the right side of the road. On the other hand, British Columbia, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island all changed from left side traffic to right side in the early 1920s. Oh, wow. Early 1920s. Ooh. It's probably got to do exactly with what you're saying. Like the British came, and so they're like, this is how you do it. And so whatever reason, the central people got affected later because they were landlocked. People from other places didn't get there as quickly as they got to the coastal areas and in. 
So it took longer to probably take effect, right? But by then, the mm-hmm. middle people had already been like, we, we ride on the right <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and then maybe that was one of their statements in independence when they went you know, to a country instead of just a commonwealth or whatever. I know. Um, totally random I but know. i just i noticed that that was the one thing that i really noticed I was like, oh, you you're so bored you're like yeah. oh, yeah. oh look they're on the other side of the road <laughs> what else is going on in here i had a nap while watching the movie <laughs> no we had to stop the movie i was like i'm falling asleep i was like i need a 10 minute nap so we turned off the movie <laughs> I had a 10 minute nap and then we continued to watch the movie because I was like, I can't. Nap. I would have been asleep. I was so tired. <laughs> yeah, but it was just so slow. Yeah. He didn't watch yeah. the last hour. I was like, I'm going to stay up and do this. <laughs> it was done. I was like, it's done. Oh, yeah. Uh, just what did you think about how the very ending happened with the weird radio show? Like, I know that was actual legit of the book. With Jack White? I was like, is that Jack White? And it is. Yeah, right? Jack White what there. a great cameo. Oh, yeah. Was... <laughs> totally. Did he do some of the music for the movie? Because it, it seemed like, I didn't notice, but Dan did. He's like, he's like, oh yeah, I think he did some of the music because it sounded like him playing in the movie. Some of the music was pretty cool. You know what I mean? It wasn't like Western. Yeah. Or... Well, and have you ever heard that album by Jack White called Lazaretto? Or that's got some Western yeah. vibes, you know, like saloon type stuff. So the radio show was interesting. It's a weird way to wrap it up, I guess, but throw some it. stuff in. I thought it was cool. I, I, I liked that it. they how to see it. how they made all the sound effects where yeah. they were like do, 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 the different things they did. I thought that was really neat. And how are you supposed to do how that? How are you going to wrap you need it up? To wrap. Yeah. Yeah. I did like it. I wasn't expecting it. Yeah. No, I thought it was a fun way to end too, especially I watch videos of people, how they make sounds for movies and stuff. (laughs) So when I was watching that, I was like, no way that TikTok is in this right now. (laughs) So yeah, no, I liked it. I thought it was a fun little, because it was just boring. I felt like it was a nice addition. I was like, cool. That was something I enjoyed watching from the movie, you know? And it was a good way to wrap it up or the movie was going to go on forever. I was like, are we going to do a wrap up? What happened now? Like, oh my God, it's already three and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a good way. Yes. Well, it was very like unique and creative and yeah, totally quirky and whatever. Good way to wrap it. Other than just writing it out. You know how sometimes movies just write it out like this is what happened and you're like trying to quickly read what ended up happening to the characters. I thought I was better than that. Yeah. I don't know if I hadn't read the book first. I don't know if I would have really understood everything that was going on in the movie, though. Same. Yeah, I agree. I felt more kind of, I don't know, if outraged, like maybe more outraged reading the book, being like, I can't, like, I believe it. I can believe it. And that's the worst part, that this all this happened, and it's believable, and it's terrible. But still. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like at the uh, end. What are they going to do? Make it longer? I <laughs> dog-eared a page about the death rates, too, and the death toll. Over the 16-year period from 1907 to 1923, 605 Osage died, averaging about 38 per year, an annual death rate of about 19 per thousand. The national death rate now is about 8.5 per thousand. In the 1920s, when counting methods were not so precise and the statistics were segregated into white and black racial categories, it averaged almost 12 per thousand for whites. By all rights, their higher standard of living should have brought the Osage a lower death rate than American whites. Yet Osage were dying at more than one and a half times the national rate. And those numbers do not include Osage born after 1907. Hmm. it was just such a huge massacre genocide like i don't know what the right word is but like it was an intentional and it was just so greedy like i just hate how whatever the reasoning the entitlement and it's just fucking crazy and how people were so angry about them having money and for what like at the end of the day it's for what you're on this life for such a short period of time in the grand scheme of evolution and you're gonna use that to like just be a piece of shit I don't, it's so weird you just have so much hate i think so much fear and hate like so that's what it stems from and like ego like it's like they're blind yes and they're already charging them more for everything you're already Dude, just we... so greedy already you're already making mm-hmm. a sh- so much more money off them purchasing things from you and mm-hmm. using your services why do you have to kill them too like you have to have you need more you need to yeah, have everything it like yeah. it's just so greedy and it's sick just, like it's 
to be around Disgusting. someone like that to be in a to be in a society like that like it really it, it's exhausting for everyone involved yeah nothing good comes of it yeah well yeah. you can't think of somebody as a an equal or a human being if you're going to treat them that way so they obviously thought of totally. them as lesser than and where race comes in right yeah. race sexism all of it so shall we go okay. around with our recommendations yeah. or not movies or books yes please both neither one yeah. so many combinations of how you could recommend here I'll, um, uh, i recommend both i liked reading the book and watching the movie but yeah the movie it was very long but after reading the book which was also very long and detailed i kind of like watching the movie afterwards so i enjoyed it just be prepared you're going to be watching for a long time <laughs> You need an afternoon. Yeah. Three days, maybe. And reading for a long time, really. It was a long book. It was long well, days, I didn't find days. the book to be that long. I felt like I read the yeah, book fairly quickly. I liked the chapter length. That was something I wanted to say about Hunger Games. The chapters were fucking long, too. Like, yeah. when is this chapter over? And I have, like, a weird OCD <laughs> thing where I want to finish reading on a chapter. Like, I don't mm. want to just stop in the middle. And so having read them in the order that we're reviewing them or whatever, I did this one next and it was a pleasant relief because I could easily digest a chapter and potentially even two in a setting instead of fighting and keeping one eye open to try to get to the end of the stupid <laughs> chapter to be done it. This book also did a really good thing where they did, even within the chapter, they'd have the little marker. To yes, mark I can let myself stop section there. Section of fact. <laughs> it's very helpful to me. Right, yeah. me too. Yeah, so like sometimes too. I could just pop open the book and read for like 10 minutes and be like, okay, I can end there and not yeah. finish this chapter and that's yeah. okay. Totally. Yeah, it was really good that way. So I would recommend both. How about you, Mer? Let's see. The book, I like him. I didn't take me that long to read the book. So I, I didn't find it to be too long. I, I liked that it had pictures in it. I really like oh, yeah. books with pictures, especially Same. the historical mm -hmm. book. <laughs> so I would recommend it. I was thinking it was going to be really poorly written. I think that if I hadn't got that first review, I would have been more critical of this book because I was expecting mm. not very much. I would recommend it just for the interest. It's something that I'd never heard about that had happened. So just from a historical pers perspective, I think that's interesting. The movie, I did not enjoy the movie. I don't know if I'd recommend the movie because of the amount of time it takes to watch it. And there were certain aspects that I didn't like, like certain portrayals of people who were victims, but they were portrayed in a way that I thought was disrespectful to the people as they were described in the book. So I didn't like that. And it's mostly just a movie about the bad guys. And, um, you know, if I have a certain amount of time to watch a movie, do I want to be watching a movie just about the bad guys? It's kind of a feel bad. <laughs> kind of a bit of a, I know it's not supposed to be a feel good movie, but maybe I could feel better if it focused more on the other people in the movie, not the people who are going around killing everybody. Yeah, I think that's a good point too, though, Mir, because the lack of satisfaction that you get from the whole end of the movie and the experience is a whiff of the lack of satisfaction of all of the families who didn't get any justice or answers or, you know what I mean too? So I don't know if that's just me making a big stretch or if that was intentional even. That um, was an artistic decision, maybe. maybe so that maybe. you feel, I think it's it's good that the story is being told. So, you know, either, I don't know if it was a fiction, if I would recommend either, let's say. But since it's true, I would say either watch the movie or read the book. They're sure. both fine. They might take you the same amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> i'm like that too like there's some problematic things with the movie and maybe the book but the story or the knowledge of the the history i guess the awareness of that is important and i guess it matters how the history is shared so i'm iffy on the movie uh like because if you're just not going to read the book you're just going to watch the movie i'm not sure you're going to get really an understanding of the history that I think is the most important piece of this story. <laughs> I don't know if this is the book to read to figure out about it either, but I don't know if there is other information out there around here to get more information in a better accurate way or whatever, right? So I think it's important to know, to seek knowledge around these things. I don't know if the mediums with which we received this knowledge are the best way to receive it but i do think it's important to pursue the knowledge nonetheless so dry is that a recommendation <laughs> who knows <laughs> who knows unsure <laughs> unclear kim Did we unclear give you enough information that. in this podcast for you to have some information i'm sure you can find something on the internet if you want to find out more about what happened 
at least yeah. spark notes <laughs> yeah. you know i agree with both of you all of you that i think that the story is really important and that had this big blockbuster movie not come out and had this book not been a bestseller then maybe none of us would know about it so hey good for all of these people involved that are bringing the story to the general public so everybody knows about it but i did not like either <laughs> i couldn't get through the book i found it too factual and not enough of the story just like mary says i want to know more about molly and her their story and then i just found the movie just two hours too long like two yeah. hours like it could have been like an hour and a half <laughs> I think that you could read an article yeah. about this story and learn just as much and you know than you could doing either of these so I would say a no to either but hey great for them for bringing the story and Kim said it yeah, maybe not the medium's the right way but the story is good that they learned about it all right um, Ashley yeah no I agree with you guys totally I would not recommend the movie even if you read the book it's just it's long it's boring I don't think the telling of the story is as similar to the book like I don't think the point of the movie comes across as it does in the book I would recommend the book but more for like I think as an introduction to the history of colonization type of thing I think it's a lot more digestible for maybe people who aren't Indigenous to read that and kind of like get it to be like, oh shit, like massacres were happening. You know, we were treating people like this. But I don't personally see any of my Indigenous friends reading this book and being like, I learned something from this and it was good storytelling. So yes and no. I will say though, at the end of the night, I will listen to an audiobook or a podcast and I'll play Sudoku to go to bed. And I like when it's true crime. So this was really nice for that. So if you do something <laughs> like that, honestly, it was it was a pretty good because it's long. So, you know, you get many nights out of it. But yeah, so that that's my thing. I didn't hate listening to it. Hated watching it. Absolutely. I think the story is important. And I agree. Like if it didn't become this movie and probably if these big names weren't attached to it, it wouldn't have been such a, a bestseller and a big box hit. So in a way, I'm thankful for that. But yeah. 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 Great. Uh, what are we doing next? A Long Way Home or The Immortal Life? Oh, what are we doing next? Which one is it? Life in Long Way Home. I'm going to look. I wish I knew. I haven't got the book yet. Yeek. Yeah, I feel like it's Long Way Home, but I could check. Almost 100% certain it's is Long Way Home. Is the movie called Long Way Home? No, as well? it's called Lion. No, it's called Lion. Oh, okay. Uh-oh. Oh, that book. Oh, I've seen that and read yes. that. Do you have any I initial think. thoughts for... Don't say yeah. anything. No, I'm not saying anything. It was a long oh. time ago. Yeah, Long, long Way Home way. is the next one. All right. Okay, so nice, nice to see, see you. you. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> Bye. 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 This interruption is brought to you by Unpublished. Do you want to know more about the members and Book Interrupted? Go behind the scenes? Visit our website at www.bookinterrupted.com. Book Interrupted. So lately my biggest interruption has been... This one-year-old ball of fluff, my puppy dog, Barley. This dog has taken to interrupting me whenever she sees me reading a book. Like, she can't stand it. She's worse than a toddler. I'll be sitting there reading my book, and in she comes, and she knocks it out of my hand. <laughs> I have to have my wits about me and know what page I'm on, because if that dog wants to be pet, or she wants somebody to play ball with her, then all bets are off. Book interrupted. It's book report time. We're going to find out from each member their final thoughts. And do they recommend the book? Let's listen. Okay, this is my personal journal for Killers of the Flower Moon by David Gran. I don't know what to say in this journal that I didn't already say in our group discussion. Usually I do my journals ahead of time and... The timing just didn't work out. I didn't finish reading this book until yesterday. And then I watched the movie last night and then we recorded the group today. So what do I want to say? I guess it's piece of history magnified that really has a pretty concentrated example of how terrible indigenous people were treated post-contact. And this is 
hundreds of years post-contact at this point, this piece of history, because it's 1900. I'm sure that there are hundreds and hundreds of stories like this that could be told that underline, I guess, genocide, torture, total horrific circumstances that is a part of Indigenous history post-contact. So I don't have much to say about this in the sense of a personal journal. I'm just stuck on, you know, how there's like, if you have one person, you can feel empathy for them. But if like this is like a study, the human capacity for empathy is altered by the amount of people represented in the consideration of whether you're going to feel empathy for them. If there's one person, two people, then there's a strong motivated response from empathy. But if there are groups of people, you're less like affected by it. So I don't know what my point is. I guess my point is telling each story helps really create an understanding in the listener or the reader or the viewer of the depth of the atrocities. Whereas, you know, if you just say statistics from the 1500s, since contact, you know, white men came and they did this and they did that. And like, it's faceless, nameless people. And so when the people have names and you can see their faces, you know, it obviously makes it that much more meaningful in understanding how absolutely terrible post-contact life for indigenous folks is was and continues to be in varying degrees so i said this in the group i think it's important that we seek more information about these stories so that we can educate ourselves on things but also whether this particular book or that particular movie is the best way to educate yourself on this particular story I'm not sure about. But if that's the only way that you learn about it, then I think that that's better than not knowing at all. All right, that'll be it for this one today, folks. Hello, I am back once again for my second book of this season. Very excited still to be back here. I have to first say that I did not finish the book, The Killers of the Flower Moon. Not my favorite. There were so many details in it that made it really difficult for me to get into the heart of the story. I do read a lot of investigative journalism books and I I like the stories of the characters and I found this was just like a very factual, uh, which was good. It was good to have the facts. The story is such an important story to tell. So I'm happy that it's out there. It just wasn't my favorite book. I want to read just a little excerpt of what I mean about extra details. So they're talking about this one character, this auctioneer that does not, this is the only time I think the auctioneer shows up in the whole book. And this is, so the auctioneer, a tall white man with thinning hair and a booming voice would eventually step under the tree. He typically wore a gaudy striped shirt and a celluloid collar and a long flowing tie, a metal chain connected to a timepiece dangled from his pocket. He presided over all the Osage sales and his moniker, Colonel, made him sound like a veteran of World War I. In fact, it was part of his christened name, Colonel Ellsworth E. Walters, a master showman. He urged bidders with a folksy saying like, come on, boys, this old wildcat is liable to have a mess of kittens. And there's more about this auctioneer. And I find that sometimes in books when there's just so many details, I understand that the author really wants to put you in that world. And for some people, this is perfect for them. And so wonderful. You're going to love this book if that's for you. For me, I'm just like, okay, get to the point. Let's tell me the story. Tell me the emotions behind it. I don't need to know exactly what he wore that takes up a full paragraph of a character that I'm never going to hear again. So for me, that's just the way this. So I just couldn't. I tried. I got through about half of the book and then was not. But I think maybe I'll read the last couple of sections because I've heard they're quite good and different than the movie itself. The movie, so long, just far too long. Although there's so many reviews online that people say it's an epic masterpiece and they love it. But I just want to say this one review because I was reading through that I thought was funny. This person says, so this movie literally has the same pace as the Conestoga wagons as they headed west across the open plains to arrive in Oklahoma. 
I did feel a bit like that. Like it was just everything, long drawn out conversations. I hated that it was just about the men too. And I really wanted to hear more of say Molly's story and the other characters' stories as opposed to these two men. And I think it was just uh, because they were these famous actors. It was all about them, but I didn't didn't love that. Yeah, not my favorite movie by far or definitely not my favorite book, but I did appreciate the story. I'm really glad I learned about it and I think that I would have maybe not learned about it had this movie not come out in this book. So that's wonderful that that's happening, that people can hear about this story. But yeah, not my cup of tea, as they say. Okay, great. Well, thanks and I will see you in the next book. Bye. Hi everyone, it's Ashley and I'm doing my personal journal for Killers of the Flower Moon. I think this is a really important story. I do like the book. The movie's good. I think it is a story that needs to be told. However, as an Indigenous person, I'm tired of this story. <sighs> While it's really important that Indigenous stories are being told, they're all kind of the same in the sense, and it always feels that there's not true justice, and that's kind of how I felt in this case. I believe it was the FBI that had investigated all of the murders and again they just couldn't figure it out and I know this was earlier on I believe when the FBI was just starting. Anyways, I'm just tired of it. I want to hear a story about Indigenous people succeeding. That's the end of it. I want to hear a story about Indigenous people going missing and being treated the same. Yeah, so that's kind of my take on it. Again, I do think it is a good story. The book was good. I am excited to hear what the other ladies have to say about it as well. And just hear the girls' opinions. Also, if you have listened to the story, read the story, watched it, or even know anything about it, I think it would be really awesome to have some audience engagement as well to hear from the reader's perspective as well. So thank you so much, and I can't wait to see the ladies in a bit. Bye. Okay, so sometimes I record a personal journal, and then I decide to listen to it a little bit just to make sure I sounded okay. Believe it or not, I do that, even though I'm always rambling on. And I was listening to it and, like, totally got a word wrong over and over and over. So here I am. I'm here again, although it's all the same to you. So I realized that in the group discussion, we didn't really explain what the book The Killers of the Flower Moon was about. I feel that maybe some people don't know what it's about. The subtitle for it is The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. So this book takes place before the FBI was the thing. And just when J. Edgar Hoover was, he was just starting uh, to lead the Bureau of Investigation. He wanted to build into a bigger thing that was using fact-based investigations and, and other things. He really wanted to control things. So he wanted a case that would further his political aspirations as far as the bureau went so i'm going to read from the back of the book and kind of about what this book is about because it's not just about j edgar hoover that's not the main part there's no reason for me to improvise because i got the book right here here we go in the 1920s the richest people per capita in the world were members of the osage indian nation in oklahoma after oil was discovered beneath their land they rode in chauffeured automobiles built mansions and sent their children to study in europe then one by one the Osage began to be killed off. The family of an Osage woman, Molly Burkhart, became a prime target. Her relatives were shot and poisoned. It was just the beginning, as more and more members of the tribe began to die under suspicious circumstances. It's later revealed in here that her family was not the only ones that were being targeted or the people around her. However, the murders that are related to her family are the ones that got prosecuted, and most of them did not. So that's kind of why this ended up in a book and then now a movie. It's an interesting part of North American history that I knew nothing about. I didn't learn about, about this before. So for that reason, it was nice to read this book, even though it's talking about some pretty bad things. But I've already kind of said what I wanted to say about the book and the movie in the group discussion. So I thought maybe I would talk about where my mindset was when I was reading this book, because at the same time as I was also reviewing The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, the prequel to the Hunger Games trilogy. And I also <laughs> have been questioned by my daughter about religion and where the stories come from and I was telling her that the stories come from real knowledge that was probably passed down through generations and you know back now we're talking about if you want to talk about that more go back to season one 
book one, Women Who Run With the Wolves, really talks about storytelling and what it tells us and the symbolism there and how storytelling is a way to pass down information. But I was also listening to one of my favorite podcasts that's called STEM Talk, and they had a guest on called Peter Piroli, and he was talking about something that's called information foraging theory. And essentially what it is, is it's talking about a way that humans collect information that's very similar to how we forage or we had to forage from an evolutionary standpoint to get food and survive, but that that's how we also consume information. So we don't get all the information that's out there and then make our best decision. We kind of pick information that we need and then put it together into knowledge. So, I mean, that's where kind of, I guess, unconscious bias comes in and things like that, where if you didn't take all the information, but you took snippets based on how you forged information in the past, and that's kind of how you put your knowledge together and form your opinions. And I guess it's kind of like how the FBI essentially had to do it in this book too. They went looking for information. They didn't get everything, but they had to piece together a story based on the evidence that was put there. I guess in a way that does tie in a little bit to this book. But it also got me thinking about the individualism that is shown in this book, the looking out for number one, the greed, you know, greed has been on my mind a lot lately. <laughs> I don't know, not because I'm feeling greedy, but just, I don't know, it just seems to be surrounding us, right? Maybe just because we're coming out of Christmas now, and it just seems like such a greedy season. I mean, just all the advertising around Christmas is just kind of takes away from the good feelings of Christmas, doesn't it? But it got me to thinking about how more and more... I guess just the way I was raised in this kind of Western culture to look at things as an individual, just like the cowboys in this book were looking out for themselves and President Snow is looking out for himself, but they're not looking out for humans as a group or as like the human organism where we all have something to contribute. If we put all of our information together, which I think that scientists called cooperative information foraging that's where you get the best kind of information or you can solve some good information if everybody has some good problems everybody has different information they bring together that's what you get when you have a group when you think about us all as one big maybe organism that we can work together you know i've been thinking more and more about people like trees in a forest you know like a forest is not just a tree beside a tree it's it's everything together if we started thinking of humans more like that where no one's an island we're all part of a bigger thing a bigger being then maybe we would do better so i think this is kind of where i was going on on the group discussion if you could pass down information like the blanket that the osage women wore molly burkhart wore she wore more traditional clothes it says in the book it wasn't just somebody decided to put that on one day it was like passed down there was a reason for everything and then it develops into the cultural clothing that someone's going to be wearing down the road whereas you know my clothing is based on well <laughs> maybe not mine but someone's clothing might be based on what's the latest trend that could be changing it monthly which is completely different the reasons for wearing what i wear might be different than if i go back a few hundred years Years, what people were wearing then might have been more practical maybe you have to go back in my history more than a few hundred years for something that was practical but you get the idea so I don't normally read true crime I find it super disturbing and this book was no exception super super disturbing however I think the author did a really good job the way he laid out the book and how he indicated all the different things that were happening, but not all together, so you got confused. He kind of moved the story along with all the complications of the story without making me feel completely lost. Like, who's that again? And who's that? And who's related to that? And I wasn't confused. He did a really excellent job unraveling what happened. And I really liked at the end how he said it wasn't just William Hale that did it. He wasn't the only evil person. There was many, many of these horrible white men <laughs> killing for the oil rights. Yeah, I thought also that the movie, it was, I was shocked when it was three hours. I was like, oh my God, three hours. <laughs> but uh, they did a really good job with the movie. And some of the assumptions they made in the book that weren't actual facts, but the author was making some assumptions. They made them actualities. I like they kind of focused on Ernest and Molly. I think the the movie's probably going to win like a million awards. Really well done, I think, the movie was. So 
now this is two out of the season, I think that the movie did a really good job, which I wasn't expecting. And I think I said I was going to like this movie the least. So that didn't happen. I liked it a lot. Three hours a bit long for me though. Anyway, I did enjoy the book. I probably wouldn't, it's not going to like make me read more true crime, but I think that the way the author wrote the book, I got a real idea of what was happening, how the mystery unfolded, how they solved the mystery, all the people in the mystery. I like how at the end also, he went back and you heard about all the different relatives of family members that they never discovered. And I liked also how in the movie, which didn't happen in the book, but in the movie, how he said, they made that William Hill said that people will just forget and when he gets out of jail, they'll just forget, which is ridiculous and outrageous. But in the book, how people are still suffering from it. And it was from the 1920s. Obviously, it was horrific. And I like how that paralleled, if you read the book and you realize like people are still suffering. Generations just still trying to figure out what happened to their family members just to have closure. And how the movie kind of foreshadowed that with Hale saying people just forget, which is just true evil. I also like how they portrayed Ernest in the movie. I don't know if I had as much sympathy for Ernest <laughs> in the book, but I can see how he was kind of had a fear maybe of his uncle more than his love for Molly, I guess. I did get a sense in the book and in the movie that he loved his wife, but he clearly wanted the money more, I guess, or his, was afraid of his uncle more. I don't know what that is. And also in the book, it implies that he knew his children are going to be blown up. That's what I got from the book. Maybe everyone, I'll ask everyone else what they think. I think the book said that Cowboy was angry at his father because he knew his father was willing to blow him up and his mother and his sisters with his aunt and uncle, Rita and Bill, I think it was, Bill Smith. So I think it was nicer in the movie that he was like, where are you? And he was worried about them. But in the book, it kind of implies he knew they were going to be blown up and he was just going to be okay with that didn't enjoy that yeah very intense book and movie anyway I look forward to talking to everybody about it and I think I would recommend both go see them both I would read the book and then watch the movie yeah thank you for joining us on this episode of book interrupted if you'd like to see the video highlights from this episode please go to our YouTube channel book interrupted you can also find our videos on www.bookinterrupted.com hi this is Leah from Book Interrupted. We'd love to get to know all of our members way, way more. So write in, comment, like, subscribe, the works, because we want to get to know you, hear what you think about our podcast, and more. Go to www.bookinterrupted.com and please keep listening. Book Interrupted. Never forget, every child matters.